Our last speaker will be Dick Thorpe. Dick is a uh, internist from Paradise. Um, turns out he and I came, came to Butte County the same month, which is why I thought he'd been here forever and he thought I'd been here forever. Uh, he's been a valued colleague of mine for many years. Uh, in addition to his clinical practice of internal medicine, he's been very involved in organized medicine with the Butte Glen Medical Society, the California Medical Association, and the AMA. Um, Dick has had so many roles in those organizations that if I listed them all, it's almost as long as the title of Lebowski's book. So I'm not going to try to get through, get through all of them. Nevertheless, Dick is uniquely qualified to talk about health care reform, both from the perspective of a primary physician and uh, from a person who's been involved in organized uh, medicine. Dick. Thank you, David. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I, I will say that um, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act or health care reform that uh, has accomplished that I think, um, whether it was intentional or not, is the incredible interest in health care and the, the delivery of health care because it's such a personal thing. Health care is a local, um, is really, although we need a global fix, health care really, all health care is local. And your doctor, your hospital, your specialist, those are the people that, that are, interact with you in a personal way and provide the, the service and the, um, the interface for you for this healthcare system. I, I would just point out that over, the, I, I, as Dave said, I've been here probably way too long uh, as doing this, but I'm still practicing. I'm not thinking about giving it up yet. I'm very, even though all of these things are going on, and I, I actually approach this from a very different way. Um, I actually um, uh, uh, looked at a, um, a new, new to me, I should say, um, a concept that's called USA Inc. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's a uh, private analysis of the healthcare, of, well, of the US government, USA, the United States government. And it does it from the standpoint of a financial analyst. And, how are we doing as a, as a corporation in the U USA Incorporated? And there's some, some very um, troubling things, and I want to talk a little bit about that because healthcare fits right in the middle of that, and we have to think of these problems not only as a local, or a local group of citizens, but we also have to think about how it affects our entire company, our entire, not company, but our country. Um, those things are, are, are critical to us. I do think that, you know, um, I have been proud to be a physician since I was accepted to medical school, actually. Um, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to do. I've enjoyed my practice. I've enjoyed the interaction with patients, and I enjoy the ability to intercede in people's lives in a way that even their priest doesn't have the access that, that their doctor does. And I don't mean that in a, in a hierarchical or, a, you know, a, some kind of... Um, special way except that it's just the truth. When people are ill, when they're in trouble, when they're in pain, you have the ability to, to reach them in a, in a very special way. And Hank uh, talked about that and the importance of how, how important it is when you're dealing with someone at the end of life. So as I became involved in, um, in the healthcare debate, um, actually a number of years ago, um, it became clear to me that there were, there's, in spite of all this wonderful stuff that we're able to do, there are just some huge problems in delivering the care. I mean, in, in this layering that Mike talked about, in terms of the amount of layering between me seeing my patient as 5.30 today as I was finishing up my practice, and being able to send that to a, to, to be able to get reimbursed for it, is, it is a significant amount. And it's not just one thing. It's 20 things every day. It's the insurance company coming between you and your, your patient saying, oh, this, uh, this ACE inhibitor we don't cover for your blood pressure. And that's all they say. They don't tell you which ones they do cover. They just say, we don't cover this one. You figure it out, which is something that potentially could be fixed. But it's not, an, not it takes time. Your staff has to take time. It's a, it's, a, it's a very complicated, um, time-consuming uh, process. So there are a number of ways that 
that I believe efficiencies can be accomplished, we may differ in the way we think that the things can be implemented in some ways. Um, I am a little bit concerned about, you know, I'll, I'll show you in a minute, I mean, the entitlements, the, the uh, subsidized entitlements that we have developed in the United States have been consistently underfunded for the last, well, since, since Medicare was instituted in 1965. Consistently underfunded. That's the reason why private insurance charges so much is because the, the government doesn't pay enough. That's the reason. Now, maybe there's a way to get around that, but it does concern me to say we're going to have Medicare for everyone when the Medicare system right now is going bankrupt. Um, I think there are some, some, some issues that we have to, to grapple with as a, as a society if we're going, and, and these issues are whether we do it on a, you know, some kind of uh, system where you have to pay out of pocket to be able to do some things, so that if you want to do more expensive things, you have to pay a little bit more for those, or whether we do it, you know, as Medicare for all, we're going to have some difficult decisions to make no matter what system we go, go with, because everyone cannot, we, can't, we as, a, as a society, excuse me, got dry while I was waiting there, as a society, we cannot afford to give everything to everyone that wants what they want. That's just the bottom line. You can't afford to do it as a society. And at some level, we're going to have to make a decision who, who makes that decision. Do we allow people who are bright individuals, generally speaking, the United States population is well educated, they have the ability to make decisions on their own. If they're given the options of how to choose would you rather have, be able to choose on your own, given the fact that you're, you have some, some education about what you're, what you're buying, or would you rather have some bureaucrat somewhere tell you what you can have? And I think that's the real question that's at heart here, is how do we make those decisions? Do we, do we depend on our educated, elect, our educated uh, constituents, or do we depend for that kind of uh, um, decision making on someone who, who knows better than we do how to, how to make those decisions. Um, I'm not quite sure how to get started here. How do I? By the way, I, I um, let's see, click to exit. Okay, that's not. sure how to maximize this now. It's funny. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, this is, uh, some, of this, some of these slides are taken from Elizabeth Meeker, or Mary Meeker, at the USA Inc., and so I'm, I'm borrowing from her because her slides were better than mine. Um, and, and I think what we need to know is a community, what, how, what are the difficulties in, in providing health care across the country? Because I think, although I would just make the assumption, and I, maybe this is an incorrect assumption, but my assumption is that even though I'm in a for-profit business, that I'm still trying to make moral decisions for myself and for my patients. Morality, I think, is, I mean, yes, we're all moral. We want this to be a moral decision, but I don't think morality is the key um, to deciding how your healthcare system is going to work, because I assume that you're going to make moral decisions no matter what the economic uh, system is. Because I think it really does matter whether you can have access, and just giving a, getting a card does not mean access. It has to do with quality and it has to do with cost. And I think these are the problems. There is decreasing access. You, it's very difficult, and especially with certain kinds of, of payment. But not just because of certain kinds of payment, it's difficult because there aren't enough providers to provide the, the, the care that needs to be provided. Cost, as has already been pointed out, are skyrocketing, and it's not clear that we're, we're actually getting the quality for the cost that we're paying. Um, there's a huge primary care physician shortage. You can't see the doctor often enough, and these co the cost of needed medication often delays um, their acquiring those medicines. 
This just shows, this is a, um, a slide from the American College of Physicians, which shows the uh, decrease in enrollment for primary care physicians. Is this a pointer? Uh, I guess this is the slide, okay. Oh, there we go. So um, the decrease in the enrollment of, of uh, internal medicine and pediatricians in their general, general uh, areas and, oh, thank you. Actually, I figured it out. It's, and, and here is the increase in internal medicine subspecialty where reimbursements are significantly different. Um, and, I, and I agree with Dr. Abrams that uh, we have a graying physician workforce. There's an extreme dissatisfaction with, uh, in, in the physician community. There's a fewer medical school applicants. Young physicians really don't want to work the same way that I started work when I, when I came to the, uh, to, to the practice of medicine. I figured I was going to work 80 hours a week, and that was just the way it was. But, you know, there are physicians who want to actually have a life, and they want to do something else besides practice medicine. And they don't want to have to go through a divorce or, you know, have difficulties with their children. They want to actually be a parent. Um, in, in, in California, physician recruitment is extremely difficult because we have a very high cost state and we have relatively low reimbursement for uh, most every specialty in the, in the state. And the new trend is that mature physicians are actually exiting early. So we've got, not only do we have these other issues to deal with, but we've got a, a looming physician shortage. I think the issue of quality is another issue. Um, this this uh, shows kind of per capita costs and life expectancy, and here we are. Our costs are huge, and our life expectancy is not that much different, certainly not as good as Japan. Um, those of you who have been engaged in this debate are clearly, you know, clearly know these, these statistics. And this is a list of a number of things you know, related to different, different quality indicators, obesity, infant mortality, and the USA is 34th. Um, Best is number one, worst is 30. Um, so, you know, it's, it, we, we don't score that well on, on some of these studies. And here is the, here's the, here's another great slide, I think. This is the USA spending on healthcare. This is in 2007, $2.2 trillion. Um, this was the United States spending. This is the median, uh, um, all of the, other, uh, of the, well, actually, all of the, uh, this is organized, um, economically developed countries in the world, combined, they only reached 2.2 billion, or 2.2 trillion, which is what the United States was all by itself. And this was the, the middle of that, that range right here. And this is per capita spending on average. Um, per capita spending for the United States is huge. Um, this is the median again here. And our next closest competitor is Luxembourg, which as you know is a fairly small but quite rich state. Um, so if you look at these entitlements, the, the question is, you know, what, uh, what can we learn here? And I think Mike alluded to this uh, earlier, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but in 1935, when Social Security was implemented, um, 65 was 110 percent of the life expectancy. There were only 2 percent of the population over 65, and people paying the FICA tax, there was a 45 to 1 ratio. Now, this is Social Security, not Medicare. Interestingly enough, to meet any of the above goals in 2003, you'd have to have advanced the age for Social Security eligibility to 85. <laughs> um, over the last 15 years, we've seen entitlement expenses go up twice, or, two, or double, I should say, over the past 15 years. And um, per household, it's about 16,600. Now, that's a total entitlement. That's not just Medicare. Um, 76% is directed to Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. So the other entitlements are, you know, unemployment benefits, food, nutrition. So this is um, the dedicated entitlement revenue, meaning how much money we, we get for these programs, which is mostly Social Security and um, a little bit of Medicare. And the rest of it is how much we spend on those programs. So clearly, we take in 0.8 trillion, 0.8, almost 0.9 trillion, we spend almost two trillion dollars for health care or for entitlement. Um, this show, just shows that Social Security, because we get charged for it, it actually sort of broke even, but this sh consistently shows the Medicare underfunding and I think this is Medicaid uh, as well.
both extremely, you know, not doing so well economically. Um, this is a percent change in the real um, annual Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid uh, payments for beneficiary. Medicare, 8% increase in between 1966 and 2009. Uh, Social Security, only 2% increase. Medicaid, about 3%. So there's clearly a difference in spending, as you can see, between Medicaid and Medicare. Um, basically, well, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, while beneficiaries from the aging population rose twice, or two times in 1966, from expanded uh, eligibility from other things, uh, particularly uh, disability and low income, rose 10 times. So we're giving people more, in, more benefits. Um, if you count government employees, the beneficiaries are now 30% of the U.S. population, which was 20% in 1966. So you can see that we're, the, our entitlements are, you know, the costs are huge, and um, we're, not, we're not keeping up, obviously. So the private sector health care developed in, uh, after World War II as a result of World War II incentives to try and develop wage and price controls. The health insurance costs were fully deductible to, employ, to, to employers, but were also tax-free to employees. It allowed employees to attract employers to attract employees based on their benefits. They, had, they, couldn't, they couldn't increase their wages, but they could give them better benefits, and so they could, give a, they could be a more attractive employer. And in 2003, that tax subsidy the tax deductibility for employers and the tax-free nature of, ta of health care was $188 billion. The problem with this system, of course, is that if you lose your job, you lose your coverage. It excludes the unemployed, and of course, retirees were, excluded, were excluded. And so that's why we developed these programs in 1965, Medicaid for the poor and Medicare for those that are over 65. So let's look at Medicaid for a minute. It's a combined state and federal program, 100% coverage below the poverty line, keyword poverty, poverty line, as a comprehensive set of services, it's entitlement without a copay and very limited fraud protection. The costs of this new entitlement were severely underestimated. Fraud was almost 20%, 10 to 20% from day one, and the states were given an out by being allowed to define the poverty line, meaning they could increase the poverty line and raise it so they didn't have to pay for people who were lower than that. Uh, I'm sorry, they, so they lowered their poverty, line, poverty lines. Feds mandated OB and PEDS coverage. Reimbursements were progressively worse. 90% of costs for today in California for the Medicaid program are dedicated to OB, pediatrics, nursing homes, and HIV care. This is the consistent underfunding of Medicare, Medicaid, I'm sorry, for the last 45 years. There is no dedicated revenue source for Medicaid. It's all at the whim of the legislature. So, Medicaid enrollment is up 12 times to 49 million, while annual payments for the beneficiary are up four times, only to, up to a 5,000 per, per, benef per beneficiary between 1966 and 2009. So Medicaid has not been a successful program, and many are still left on the rolls of the uninsured. If you look at Medicare, Medicare is Medicare Part A, which is hospital and inpatient costs that Mike was talking about. Medicare Part B, which takes care of outpatient costs, that's your physician costs and many other outpatient costs. Um, Medicare Part C, which is the Medicare Advantage plans that I think Hank alluded to earlier, and Medicare Part D, which is the new prescription dr drug coverage plan. So the assumptions were that there would be no significant increase in life expectancy, that if you paid more medical attention to seniors, it would decrease health care costs, and that new technologies would decrease costs and that in 1990, Medicare costs would be about $9 billion. The life expectancy, of course, has increased, as we just talked about. There is um, actually, the more you pay, more attention you pay to people and the more you deliver their care for relatively free, the more, the more increased the, the overall health cost. And new technologies don't decrease costs, they actually find they increase costs. So in 1990, costs were not $9 billion, but rather $109 billion. This is an, uh, it's just a slide illustrating that difference. Um, so over the last 45 years, Medicare has also been underfunded. Uh, we do have some revenue from Medicare, from your Medicare taxes, and there was a temporary uh, in increase right here when the Medicare tax rate increased. But overall, Medicare um, 
Part B and D expenditures and Medicare Part A expenditures, well, you can see the Medicare Part A is this line here, and these are B and D. Um, and this is the, the total Medicare net income, is if you look at it as a company, the net income is, is dropped significantly. In, uh, Medicare enrollment is up, and as you know, the baby boomer uh, um, uh, you know, phenomenon, if you will, um, is, I mean, we just have that many more people to take care of now. So there's that much more cost. So right now, in 2010, we've got 178 million or, or close in the private sector, employer-based about 163 and a half. Individually, people are buying insurance about 14.3 million. Medicaid had about 41 million. Medicare, about 39 million. And the uninsured before the um, Affordable Care Act was about 49 million. I, I just want to point out this, this, this slide, I think, is very important because what happens when, when Medicare and Medicaid underfund their program is that the costs in the private sector escalate. And that's just a law of economics. Somebody, you can't, you, you, you're providing a service, you have to be able to pay for it, and you have to find a way to pay for it somehow, so you increase the cost for, if you can, you increase the cost in the private sector. And this, this phenomenon, though, providers charge a higher price to the private market than, than they do to the government market. The cost shifts onto the private market. You have higher private market uh, cost trends higher health insurance premiums, employers uh, and consumers drop their coverage because of the high cost, increasing the number of uninsured, increasing the use of Medicaid and Medicare, government reimbursement uh, 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 pressure rises, and the government lowers the reimbursement rates. It's, a, it's just an economic phenomenon that's a cycle that we, we can't avoid. Those are the realities of what we're dealing with. The other thing that's really concerning to me is that um, if you look at the total government health care spending in the United States versus education spending uh, between 1960 and 2009, uh, government U.S. health care, or the spending for the U.S. health care system was 1.2% in um, 1960, 8.2% in 2009, and um, uh, um, Obviously, there's been this huge increase in health care and a relatively flat increase in the cost of education over that period of time. The education costs only 0.6 uh, times as opposed to seven times as a percent of the GDP over that period of time. This is just one more slide to show the difference between Japan, um, you know, uh, uh, Great Britain, France, and the United States in terms of the total health care spending as a percent of the gross domestic product. And, uh, I think uh, Jeff actually pointed out that that's closer to 18% today. This was 2007. So let's just focus on how we can address the expenses for a minute. Um, this is a, a slide which is a little bit, con a little bit uh, complicated, but basically this is the um, spending, total health care spending in 1960. This is total health care spending in 2000. And you can see the huge difference in spending and where there was no cost for entitlement programs for health care in 1960, we now have 35 percent of, of this spending budget is, uh, uh, is, is entitlement programs for the total health care costs. And the, the problem is, is, is it's just unsustainable. This is federal spending on Medicare and Medicaid as a percent of the gross domestic product, and this is the federal revenue as a percent of the gross domestic product, you can just kind of forecast. Um, on historical trend lines, and at some point they collide. The costs keep going up, and at some point we're not going to get make enough money in the country to pay for health care. And I think that's where you as citizens and, and we as citizens need to come together and find a solution, because I think, as has already been pointed out, there are real solutions that can have. I think there's some difficult decisions that need to be made. We're going to have to redesign the entitlement programs. Maybe it is Medicare for all. I, I'm not saying it, it couldn't work. I'm just saying we've got to think about this carefully and do it in a way that is, that it, that's going to work for, for our communities, not just um, because of some, and I agree, the politics, the, the politics shouldn't be driving this. The communities should be driving the politics. 
Um, I, think, I think there isn't reason to have skin in the game for everyone. If you don't have skin in the game, you tend to overutilize. And if, you, if there's no skin in the game, what happens is you start to overutilize and someone else decides to control the cost for you and for the system. And there will be decisions made that, that are going to impact you that, because you don't have any, any um, investment in the process. I think we're going to have to start talking about what are the high costs and how much, how do we deliver them? And some of these are some of the things, but there is a number, there are a number of other uh, uh, processes that we are, another other, a number of other areas, um, duplication of services, as, you know, as Jeff pointed out, uh, doing expensive testing for minimal reasons. Um, I mean, one a specific, a specific example is going into the emergency room. Somebody goes to the emergency room with abdominal pain who has irritable bowel disease. Before they walk out, I can guarantee they're going to have had complete laboratory evaluation. They're going to have abdominal and pelvic CT, um, maybe an abdominal and pelvic ultrasound. They, they're going to have a very expensive workup that had their primary care doctor been around to say, well, you know, we did that a month ago at another place, not here at this hospital, but down the road we would have saved probably $5,000 to $10,000. Um, just to give you an anecdote, my son was ill for a period of time, and I was very concerned about him. I thought, well, as a primary care doctor, I ought to be able to help sort this out. So I examined him, did some lab work, couldn't find any real obvious abnormalities, but he kept losing weight and just feel, kept not feeling well. And at, at the end of the day, I finally said, okay, we're going to get an abdominal, pelvic, and chest CT scan. Maybe he's got a lymphoma or something that's really bad. We'll get those things done. And I was thinking it was going to cost me, you know, maybe $1,000 each for those tests. And I got a bill from my hospital where I practice for $14,000. Now, my hospital administrator knows that it's not worth that much money, but my son happened to work at a place where he, he got insurance. Because he got insurance, his, insur his insurer paid not 14000 but they paid $10,000. $10,000 for tests that probably could have been done for, I mean, we charge Medicare $700 for that series of tests probably. I, I'm not sure. Mike would know. But, but it's a lot less money. And yet, I st because he had insurance, we had to still pay that 20% copay. So we had to come up with a couple thousand, or yeah, a couple thousand dollars extra. Um, I think that How's your son doing now? he's good. He's good, <laughs> not because of the CT scans, but <laughs> thanks God, he's doing good. Um, so, for us, I think the issues are: we need to improve quality at a lower cost. We need to try and figure out a way to use IT, but not develop these information silos that you can't talk to each other, but to actually have true interconnectivity. We need to try to find ways to maximize efficiency. But I really believe that all healthcare is local. What works in Los Angeles doesn't necessarily work in Butte County. And then there, these are just some ideas. If you size the problem of you restructuring Medicare, it would take huge benefit cuts to address the shortfall. 53% cuts in, in benefit payments to be able to actually balance the budget, or a 3.9% increase in taxes to be able to do that. Um, I think there's, there's some, some evidence that if you tightly manage care versus have open access, meaning you decide what you want, we'll pay for it no matter what, or we tell you you have to use generic medications, there's some significant difference in, in cost. And um, out of pocket, uh, um, you know, they are, historically we've had a lot of out-of-pocket spending. I'm not saying that's the best. But I think having no out-of-pocket spending um, may not be the best either. I, I'm, I think I just, oh well, one other thing. You know, we spend more as we get old because we have more problems. That's just the way it is. And we've got to figure out a way to find solutions to our aging problems and our aging population that are maybe not so expensive. Um, and I think there are ways to do that by um, bundling care by finding ways to get around um, episodic, tr I mean, by, by paying for every single service that's given. I think on the, on the positive th side is I think that American society has always been resourceful. We're a group of people who are thoughtful, hardworking. We want to see the best done for our society. And I think it is important. One of the advantages of this kind of a, a, a forum 
is that we have the ability to come together to share ideas and to come up with solutions that are working and that work for you as a, as a community, for all of us as a community, not, not just for one segment of the community. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dick. That was a very informative and provocative talk as well. I've got a lot of things to think about from all of you guys.